Tonight, on another thing about Tartan, I am so pleased to welcome Charlotte Fairburn to tell us the story of her writing career, including a book which caught my eye as we explored Mackay as our Clan of the Month for January, The Real Mackays. Okay, um, so Charlotte, welcome. Um, you currently live in Cumbria, which is literally just over the border into England. So are you a Scot and what's your heritage in your story? Uh, yes, I've lived in Cumbria since 1987, I think. Um, but I was brought up in Scotland and my father was Scottish and my mother's half Scottish, half Dutch. Um, and um, my ma the, re the reason I came to write about the Mackays is that my mother's brother and before that her father were the clan chiefs. Um, so it's... Uh, so although I have I have lived south of the border for more of my life than I live north of the border, and although my children are English, my kind of my interests in in my Scottish background and in Scotland generally, um, you led me to write led me to put this guide together. And so I always think we're really close to the border down here. Our HQ is near Dunn, so we're quite close to the border as well. Mm. And I mean, talk about the border like it's some kind of total change of culture. And But I, I always think like sort of Cumbria and Dumfries and Galloway, all kind of, it, it's not really distinct, is it, in terms of culture? Or would you say it is? What well, uh, I, yes. I mean, there's a, there's a northern spirit, isn't there, which, which mm. I think prevails... You know, I think although um, I'm very happy living south of the border, I still I couldn't go much further south than I am. I think I think there's a there's a very strong magnetic pull to the north. I mean, I dare say if you went up to a man in Melrose and said, "Do you think in the same way as a man from Penrith?" he might say no. Um, uh -huh. And then the actual kind of Reva territory, you know, sort of um, that that central belt. I think that they. I mean. And that sort of seems to go up as almost as far as people's. They were a they were a breed unto themselves, in in the way that they behave. But they probably have, like you say, they that the characteristics of those early Highlanders who were so fighty, they were so tough. Um, they were brilliant mercenaries because they could survive anything, and because they loved slashing around with knives and stuff. There, there is a, there is a a commonality or right and the you know the 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 reavers were as much south of the border as they were north so i think that the northern spirit is kind of tremendous i, I like talking about it and thinking about it you know it's kind of proud and down to earth and robust and uh and yes i think i think you're right i think that's that that that's that that's definitely a thing and when you mention the border reavers, so obviously um, there's still the riding of the bounds and things that goes on. Mm. So down your way, it goes down kind of line and maybe yeah. the closest one to you. So do you, have you participated in any um, of that? Not that really. We're a bit, where, where I am, we're a bit further south. I'm near yeah. T-Bay, if anyone knows mm. T-Bay services. I live near there. Um, but my mother's uh, relations were... Um, lived in the borders in around Gala Shields. And uh, when I was a child, I certainly took part in the ones in Coldstream and we had friends near Coldstream mm -hmm. and I used to go and take my pony and do those. I was absolutely terrified, but I did do it. You <laughs> <laughs> felt like a Yeah, and, well, sort of. <laughs> more, like, more, like, more, like, sort of more like a poor child just out of control on a bolting pony, I think, is how I felt. <laughs> oh, dear. So, tell us then, obviously, you've got good clan heritage there with chiefs in your background. So, do you want to tell us a bit more about that and how that inspired you? Yeah, well, um, I've, I've done lots of writing over the years. I've written some novels and I call myself a writer, although I do do other things. Um, and I came to the end of the uh, project that I was doing at Lowther Castle a couple of years ago. Well, it, uh, it, it, I still work there, but I wrote an exhibition, a permanent historical exhibition, and I wrote two guidebooks to accompany it, one, about, one based on the, the Lowther family's story. Um, and when I, was at the, when I came to the end, I thought, well, I could do this for the Clan Mackay, 
um, because I had it under my fingers and um, I decided to teach myself in design and to lay it out and design it all myself, mm -hmm. uh, which I which I then did. I spoke to my cousin, who's now the clan chief, and said, would you like it? And he said, yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, you would say that because I was funding it, but still. <laughs> um, but still, I really, you know, I, I'd, I'd never been to Sutherland. My knowledge of Scotland is limited to my childhood years. And my father was an MP, so we used to go around his constituency, but I don't really remember that. I just don't know Scotland all that well, even though I, I am a Scot. Um, and so it was a really lovely excuse to explore the North Coast, which I was absolutely blown away by. Um, and to kind of find out, you know, part of where part of our family originated from. Um, and uh, I, I decided when I when I came to put the book together, that obviously there are Mackays, there are all sorts of branches of the Mackays, the Mackays of Aberach, but Mackays of Biggis, Mackays of, um, um, well, the, 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 the Mackays that we know of, that we are. Um, and I thought to tackle a book on the clan and to try and bring all that together, the best way was to tell it through the story of the clan chiefs. Um, and I didn't want it to be a kind of great big academic tome um, because I'm not an academic and because it's slightly like kind of catching soap in the bath, trying to kind of, you know, sort of keep all the strands together. Um, so I just thought the simplest thing was to tell 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 it through the the clan chiefs. Yeah, I really like that because I yeah when after I spoke to you and you sent me a copy of the book which I've really enjoyed and and yeah I like the little chunks so I can read about all the different personalities yeah. each chief in turn and to see how how very different they were to each other yes. as well. Yeah, my favorite then my favorite character is the first Lord Ray. Donald Dew, mm -hmm. who was uh, um, who's the most famous of them, really, and uh, he was made um, Lord Ray by Charles the. Sorry, I'm going to just look look up a um, uh, a bit from the book. But he was made Lord Ray in 1629 by Charles the First in recognition of the armies that he raised for Gustavus Adolphus in Sweden. He was tremendously warlike and there are lots of myths about him and uh, there's a great story about because he was somehow or other he was likened to the devil I don't I, I don't quite know how this came about but he obviously had a very magnetic character um, and there's there's one story that the, the devil was cross with him so he gave him a bunch of fairies to to work for him and the fairies at first it seemed like a gift because they worked 24 hours a day and then it became a nuisance because you couldn't keep them busy so he eventually Donald Dew sent them to the Pentland Firth to plat sand um, because their job would never be finished. Anyway yeah. there's a there was a man called Ian Trimble who anyone listening to this might have um uh, sorry, Ian Grimble, I beg your pardon, who wrote The Chief of Mackay in 1965. And he's a great man of Sutherland. And he describes, he writes this description of Donald, the first Lord Ray, when he was appeared in Westminster Hall to take a, a case of um, treason, um, to appear in court anyway. He was a swarthy complexion, having very black hair, head and beard, his bearing was impressive, comely, firm, and very port-like. His doublet, black velvet, was slashed in the fashion of the day and hung with silver buttons and loops of silver and black silk. And I think it's true, by the way, that all the... I mean, my uncle certainly, they were very dressy, so it's obviously a thing. Um, he carried his sword in an embroidered silver belt and round his neck hung the jewel of his order of Knight Baronet of Scotland by a tawny ribbon. He was the 40-year-old Chief of Mackay. I think that just sets the scene. Uh, that, that's a novel, I think, Ian Gr Grimble, or it's a sort of historical kind of fictionalised yeah. version, but I rather, I rather love that description. Yeah, no, 
I, I, I have to say, I find it very readable. I really enjoy mm. it. Mm. So what, have you always been a writer then? Have you always loved writing or is that something you've um, come to? Listen yes, to? I have. I've always loved it since I read Barbar when I was a child. I've always wanted to do it, although um, I... I mean, I haven't always done it. I had some novels published at the beginning of the 2000s. Um, and then uh, my life sort of slightly took me in a different direction. I got I got divorced, which kind of punched a slightly big hole in my time. And uh, um, it's really in the last five or six years that I've got back to, back to being creative in that way but I have I've always written I've written sort of nonsense verse I wrote a comic novel which I self-published called One World One Chutney and we in fact my, with my friend Lulu who I think you might have come across we had a chutney festival at Needpath about um when was it nine years ago or something that was a that was a crazy venture uh and I just finished a novel sorry no, I was just going to say we just we were doing a whole thing on Need Path the other week because we were on the Fraser. Oh plan. right, so, oh, yes, of um, course. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's an ma amazing, amazing place. We had um, for the One World Chutney, One One World One Chutney Festival. The reason we called it that, well, it was because I'd written a book of that name. But the reason I called the book that was because I started to write it during the year of the Beijing Olympics. And they had this ridiculous slogan, which was one world, one dream. Um, so I, I, I stole it and uh, <laughs> made it my own. But we had, among the various mad games that we had at the Chutney Festival was um, uh, one of those, you know, those um, uh, catapults, the, the ones that you can stand up on and you can pull them right mm -hmm. back. And yeah. then we had Map of the World stuck on the side of Need Path and a whole big stock of rotten tomatoes and you could just pull the pull the um, catapult back and see if you could land the tomato on a on a specified part of the world um, <laughs> which was very popular actually yeah um yes i i forgot where we started with all that now oh have we i always been a writer yeah if you don't been a writer yeah, yeah so you don't purely because obviously you did the, the guest book for um the book for Lowther castle as well yeah. so yeah. you're not purely a factual writer no i'm not i i'm not a, I, I think of myself as being more of a i well i like i love writing fiction i've just i've wrote a novel mm -hmm. during uh um the first half of lockdown which i'm just trying to kind of find a publisher for at the moment but I, because I've had quite a long gap in my writing career, um, or in, at least in my career of being published, it's taken me a while to re-establish myself. And would you be tempted to write about other clans then? You know. Um, yes, I would actually. I mean, I, I would. I really, I really enjoy doing it. It's quite, it's quite, it's quite an interesting exercise. Apart from the design and the layout, which I love doing, I find that very therapeutic. Um, it's uh, it's quite an interesting exercise to kind of condense history and make it, you know, make it just seem quite sort of clear. And I've I've looked I looked obviously before I started doing this I looked at quite a few other clan guidebooks and it you know it's not always achieved that I mean whether I achieved it is another matter but but just to try and think about it like that. But the but the uh, the only thing that I I had. Obviously, because Aene Aeneas, who's Lord Ray now, I had access mm -hmm. to all his archive and images and stuff. So that obviously yeah. made things fa fairly straightforward. Um, I mean, if any other any other person would like me to do another clan guide, I'd be I'd be delighted to consider it. But um, uh, it it just it it is to do it like that you just you need, need some lovely images otherwise it's just a, a little mm -hmm. bit arid and what i can't do um and as i said bef before in a way um i'm not this is not a guide to to your relations who lived in the post office on sky this is not going into that level of detail mm -hmm. and so that yeah. so to have lo having lots of images obviously makes it brings it to life in a different way Yes, it feels more story. It mm. feels more personality based, doesn't it? Mm. And that's why I quite like it. Mm. It, brings it, yeah, it brings it to life that way. Yeah. So, 
who is your audience then in terms of, of readership of that? And do you get people who then come back to you and say, well, actually, that's not correct? Or because we always find we, we publish Mackay is our clan of the month for February, so we'll publish lots of different bits of information and blogs and things. And we always get people who come back to us and say, mm, well, that's not quite right. And then someone else will say something different. So it's that whole history told in different ways. Yes. It's, has that happened with you as well? Uh, no, I did have one of my mother's friends pointed out that I made a spelling mistake, um, which <laughs> I was really annoyed about. I mean, not that she pointed it out, but that I'd made it because I... I copy edited it and proofread it myself and it's such an idiotic mistake on my part. I haven't had anybody taking issue with what I've said. I mean, most of it I derived from previous um, history books about, about the clan Mackay because there are, mm -hmm. you know, because that's where the material is. But on the other hand, I'm doing a very broad sweep. So I'm sure that, you know, people might pick you up on, on, if I was going into detail, I could easily make mistakes, but it, it's not, it's much more trying to kind of portray each individual clan chief and, you know, mm -hmm. say what they did. And also it's very, it's very condensed. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the audience is concerned, um, we were, my mother was the honorary president for the Clan Kai Society for years and years. She isn't any longer. Um, and she was also the patron i think she might still be of the the betty hill museum in strathnava which as you probably know is currently um being given a great big makeover thanks to a lottery win um so through those two those two organizations and then i made contact with the american clan mackay society and i so i've sold I, I've only published it myself. I haven't published it through another outlet, and I'm, I don't have, you know, I don't, I don't have the usual outlets into into bookshops and what have you. I, I'm just, it's just me. Um, but having said that, I've sold copies all over the world. I sold lots to the Canada Clan Mackay Society. I sold Doug McCoy must have sold two or three hundred copies for me. Um, I keep getting orders through I don't know people sort of find it um I'm just in the process actually of making it into an ebook because I because I haven't because I fulfill the orders myself and because postage is so expensive to America I thought it might help it to um you know to to to, to spread it further and then if people want the real book they can come to me uh and I can send it to them but um and the audience is Mackay's, I mean, st straight, you know, and their sets, obviously, like the the Baines or the Polsons or whatever. Yeah. Oh, well, and if anyone's listening, they can email us and we'll make sure okay. we can um, get you Thank a copy. You. So there is a real trend just now for exploring your roots and, and more interest, I think, in, in that people have in their heritage and where they've come from. So do, does that influence how you write and... Um, and, and the content that you produce, or do you feel that your one was different or from your heart? Um, well, I don't, do you know what a real Mackay is? Um, I t let's explain. I, I do because I did go and have a look, but can you explain then well, for those listening? Within, within, within the law of the clan, a real Mackay is somebody whose both sets of parents were Mackays, and I think even both sets of grandparents were Mackays. Um, so, I mean, obviously, there's the expression "the real McCoy," uh, which sometimes and McCoy is a sept of Mackay, and that just means the real thing. And there's a story about how that expression came around. But within the within the clan, to be a real Mackay is to have a a wedding photograph where everyone is a Mackay. They're not necessarily interbred, as it were, but they've got they've all they all <laughs> share a surname. Um, I. I I would love to kind of tap into the who do you think you are kind of market, but um, I think that would be that would work better if I did produce more different clan guides. You know, that would give you a little bit more heft. Just going along with one little book to one of the I once went to one of those fairs when I was working for a magazine, and you you just get lost in a stampede. I don't think I don't think I'd stand out enough. 
Um, and also because, as I say, I haven't gone into that amount of detail. Um, I, I wouldn't be, a lot of those people are coming there to ask very specific questions about their families. Um, but yes, I mean, you know, I'd love to, I'd love to tap into it generally. I, when we went to stay with Doug McCoy in, uh, in Georgia, um, I think it was Georgia. Was it Georgia? I think it yeah. was. It yeah. Georgia. Um, his wife, uh, was there. And as I was saying to you before we started this interview, they have this kind of very, it's a very sort of open, simple belief in everything. And she read this, she read The Real Nikaias before I got there. And she said, do you know, it makes me understand myself better. <laughs> And I was like, oh, dear, <laughs> I didn't realize I was being responsible for your psychological well-being. But, <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, but I'm understanding what you're Yeah, no, for. exactly, of course. But I mean, but yeah, no, exactly. I, th I think uh, particularly in America, particularly in Aus Australia, I've also sold quite a few copies to quite a few to Chile. I think where you do, you just simply don't know how your parents got to where they are. It's 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 very nice to have that sense of belonging, isn't it? Um, I can. Yeah. And so, what are you working on just now? Though you said you would do, you'd been writing another book in, in during lockdown. Yeah. So, have you finished with Lyther Castle then? Um, no, I'm still doing I'm still doing work there. I mean, it's been closed off and on over the past year for for obvious reasons but um we are doing a series of um to to kind of phrase uh interpretation panels in the garden which i'm writing and researching and these are big big panels of perspex with which is slightly like exploded exhibition panels so they have text on them and they have images but they are they're they're not laid out like a traditional panel, so therefore, and with the perspex, then you can see the ruin, the castle ruin behind, all the plants behind, or whatever. Um, and we've done we've done about twelve of those, and we're about to do about another twelve. So that's basically an outdoor exhibition, which is um, which I've really enjoyed. And then uh, at the end of last year, I finished. Um, I would I did a sort of exhibition. Uh, a series of interpretation panels again for Carlisle Cathedral, uh, which were kind of potted biographies of people who had who had been influential in the creation of Carlisle from the, its beginning in the 12th century down to today. And I also wrote their guidebook, which has just come out. Um, uh, the book that I wrote in during lockdown is a kind of allegorical magical novel called That Was the Week of the Rainbows. Um, but I don't have a publisher or an agent yet, so I can't I can't say much. It's a long listening <laughs> Yeah. And so Lila Castle, and we do love a castle story. So and you said you were doing the panels and things for that. So does that tell the story then of the castle? And because it's eight hundred and fifty years old, yeah, well, right? yeah, the, 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 the estate has been there since, uh, yeah, the tenth century and possibly earlier. We, we say mm. eight hundred and fifty years, but it's it's actually longer. The family, the family, uh, the, the the first person that I write about is called Dolphin, who was a Viking descendant who appeared who rocked up in the in the. 12th century mid 12th century um and they settled there because there was a river there was you know it it, it was it was a good a beautiful landscape although i don't expect beauty came into it i would have thought it would be the richness of the landscape the game and the water and what have you yeah. um and uh so first of all there was some kind of probably a motten bailey uh and then there was a peel tower and then there was a a 17th century house which morphed into a great big Queen Anne building called Lowther Hall, which was incredibly grand and expensive with um, one room apparently was lined with mohair. And um, they they had oh. frescoes done by Verio, who did frescoes in, among other places, Hampton, Hampton Court, Hampton Court Palace. Um, and then that house burnt down and if you're thinking about stories of characters, 
one of the kind of notable members of the Lowther family was who, who's got a nickname of Wicked Jimmy. He, even though the house had burnt down, he lived in what were called the offices, i.e., one of the wings, which probably wasn't that small, but still, he lived there. And the and the house, he was a notorious miser. He was obviously rather a genius, but but definitely odd. Um, he let the the main wing of the house become completely overgrown. And although he commissioned lots of different architects, including Capability Brown, to draw up plans for a new house, he couldn't bear to part with the money. So the house stayed um, a ruin for a hundred years. And then eventually Wicked Jimmy, he didn't live there for a hundred years, obviously, but he died and it, he was um he didn't have any children so it passed to the to who the man who became the first lord lonsdale who built lather castle which has been there since now since 18 1806 it was first commissioned um and the other main character who people n know of um associated with the lather family and with lather castle was known as the yellow earl in fact, there's a Scottish writer called Douglas Sutherland who wrote a book about him. Um, and the Yellow Earl was this kind of larger-than-life figure um, born in 1860s, 70s. Um, tremendous uh, physical specimen and very um, sporting, had an, a, a remarkable way with animals, had an absolutely out of control ego and also loved spending. And they were a very wealthy family at that point. And he basically spent his way through unbelievable amounts of money, but in doing so became incredibly famous and was kind of one of the most celebrated. He was just really, he did lots of feats of daring do, but basically he was just famous for being famous and became a very popular figure uh, among the kind of, common man as it were in the 1910s and 20s um he had lots of race horses he had lots of affairs i think although they weren't publicly talked about he but he went to the arctic and did some great uh, um he was banished by queen victoria in the 1880s because he was behaving badly with um, another man's wife and uh, there was a there was a scandal so he went off to the Arctic and came back with you know pol polar bear carcasses and musk oxes and goodness knows what and uh, um, lots of people in he, he was also a tremendous horseman and lots of people in Leicestershire still remember him or remember other people who remember him because he was such an incredible mm -hmm. horseman and a, a very brave, at, you know, over jumping fast obstacles and things. And um, again, very profligate with his money. Um, so you can you can find you can still find old Pathé clips of him when his horse won the St. Ledger and what have you. And then, uh, sorry, I'm, tell me if I'm going on too long, but it's kind of, it is, it is rather a brilliant story. Um, then, he, then he died and he, he left the castle because he'd run out of money. The trustees were, you know, so fed up with having to shore him up all the time that they, they banned him from Lowther. Um, and he left and Lowther's an absolute, was an absolutely enormous building. And by the time... He died in 1944. The house had been empty for quite a long time. His brother inherited it. His brother was 80 when he inherited it and took one look at this vast rotting shell and the, look at the empty bank account and sold the entire content. So in 1947, there was one of the biggest house sales that had been known. And then um, his, his great nephew inherited it because um his son had predeceased him and that was james lonsdale who was the fifth lord lonsdale six six maybe sorry uh seventh beg your pardon seventh and he was a young engineer who'd been at cambridge he was quite left wing he'd fought in the in the war in the normandy landings it was that time you know the 50s 40s 50s when everybody was on their knees they were exhausted those the grand days of the Edwardians were a bit kind of nauseating to them to look back on. And he just took one look at the castle and said, I'm taking, I'm knocking it down. Um, and 
he was going to kind of completely bulldoze the whole thing, but he was prevailed upon by the locals of Penrith to just not take the roof off. So he took the roof off. He took the all the lining, all the all the stone ashlar inside the building, all the wood panelling, all the doorknobs, every single thing, and sold it. Ha the contents having gone, he then sold the fabric of the building. And it stayed empty for mm -hmm. 50 years until um, the person I work with, Jim Lather, his, one of his sons, decided to get a grip of it and bring it back to life. Wow. Yeah, what it is, it's, story. An, it's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, I'm inspired. Yeah, no, you should. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it, and I've really enjoyed hearing your the real Mackays. So, if anyone wants a copy, they can get in touch, and we can sort that out for them. And yeah, meantime, thank you very much for joining us. Okay, it was a great pleasure. Thank you for asking me.